debuted that changed the way millions of people looked at faith. The Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Featuring the ministry of Robert Schuller, taught a generation that through God's love, your scars can be turned into stars. It was an idea that launched the most popular inspirational television program of its time. And today, the Hour of Power continues with a new voice for a new generation. When you put your trust in God, nothing can stop you. Pastor Bobby Schuller will encourage you and share a message that can give you a new perspective on life. Because whatever your circumstance or the obstacles you face, this moment can be your Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And welcome here, church family. It feels great to be back with you. And it is not an accident that you're here this morning. It is not an accident if you were tuning the stations and landed on here. The Lord wants to speak to you this morning. Would you turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. Well, today's going to be a great day. We're so glad that you made it a point to come to church today. And I believe that whatever burdens it is that you're carrying today, I think God's going to lift them from your heart. And uh, we know that he's strong enough to carry whatever it is that's bringing you down. So, Lord, we thank you that you're here. And it's in Jesus' name that we trust you. And we pray, Father, that you would, you would just be felt in this place. And for everyone that's watching on television, I even pray, God, that sitting and watching, Lord, that, that uh, any burdens, depression, uh, addiction... Anxiety, these things can be lifted from us. We thank you that you forgive us of our sins. You give us a fresh start. And Jesus, we put our trust in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In preparation for Bobby's message this morning, the words of our Lord found in Exodus. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. 
but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are downgrading all we make more important than God and entering into his life-refreshing spirit of freedom. For more than any other, our God is for us. Amen. Who 
wondrous being that great for short God's power and more with heart and voice his goodness praise but all the work was not complete they wanted yet that wondrous being, that grateful should God's power and more with heart and voice his goodness praise. That grateful should God's power and more with heart and voice, with heart, with heart and voice, his goodness praise. With heart and voice, with heart and voice, his goodness praise. His goodness praise.
Juliana has such an awesome voice. Her uh, album Shatterproof just came out, and uh, so I would really recommend getting it. It's an amazing album. She also is uh, husband of Ben Zobrist, who happens to be in town playing the Dodgers. He plays for the, for the Cubs. And I'm an Angels fan, so I can say, go Cubs, you know. So. No, we're so glad. Thank you, Juliana, for being here. God bless you, and we so appreciate you taking the time to be here. Welcome, thank you for joining us today. If you're just joining us, we want you to know that whoever you are, we want you to come down here to Shepherd's Grove. If you're visiting or if you live in LA or Orange County, come to Shepherd's Grove. I want to meet you. This is a church of joy. We love training children. We love training everybody. So come down here. This is a church that loves everybody. No matter where you are, you'll find a home here. Hey, let's say this together. Would you hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving? I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus 
and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Today, if you hear nothing else that I say, I want you to hear something. And this is actually a direct quote from my other grandpa. Uh, it is this, believe in the God who believes in you. Today, I want you to know something, that God really does believe in you, that God is on your side, and that God is rooting for you. So often in life, we think either God doesn't exist, or God has abandoned me, or God is punishing me. No, you are God's beloved daughter. You are God's beloved son. He is on your side in spite of the mistakes that you've made, and they may have been many. In spite of all of your flaws, warts and all, God is rooting for you. And I need you to know, we, if we are going to be men and women who walk in the ways of Jesus Christ, we have to first begin to believe that God loves us, he wants the best for our lives, and that a morally good life is also the fullest, richest life that's available to us. So I want to begin today by asking you, even commanding you, believe in the God who believes in you. It will do you good. I believe, and we believe in this church, every human being deserves dignity. You know, um, if I ever see good guys treating bad guys without dignity, I wonder if they're truly good guys. I believe that at the heart of Christianity is this idea that although there is war and there are all of these things that we face in life, at the heart of Christian behavior is this idea that every single human being deserves dignity. That God does not like it when we mock others, when we shame others, when we demean others. God likes it and approves of it when we treat, as Jesus teaches us, even our enemies with love. I believe every human being deserves dignity, and that includes you. And maybe you've been shamed. Maybe you've been shamed by religion. Maybe you've been hurt by your parents. You grew up in a super strict household, and you feel that to be a believer, to believe in God, means it's a bunch of rules and it's just feeling guilty all the time. You know, that type of thinking is the main thing Jesus criticized in his teaching ministry was religious, religiosity people. Why? Because God's heart for you is freedom, fullness, life, joy, happiness, and it's available to you today. God believes in you. God is on your side. You are God's kids. He's not going to abandon you, and he's rooting for you, even when you make mistakes. We must start there if we're to believe anything. Then, here in this church, we start with dignity. We always move to discipleship. I believe you really begin to feel dignified when you walk as a happy student of Jesus. I just believe in character and integrity. I think that when we walk with character, integrity, confession, openness, honesty, vulnerability, we start to live in a sufficiency that is only made available in the kingdom of God. In other words, if you are a person of integrity, and you are, if you're a person of integrity, you have strength. I want you to know as you continue to build your character and to put on Christ and to, and to train your life into the image and teachings of Jesus Christ, I believe that you're going to find a deep dignity and integrity that will carry you all the days of your life. God sees, in spite of your flaws, the good things that you've done. And I know that as you live every day more and more like Jesus Christ, you will find an inner strength that nothing can destroy. And that strength is called integrity. Remember, when you talk about how strong a building is, what do you call it? The integrity of that building. Your integrity is your ability to get through whatever storm it is you're going through. So remember, at the core of your life is dignity and discipleship. And so, to talk about that, today I am doing something that is a little audacious. I've been wanting to do this for a long time because a lot of people hate this topic. We're going to start a series on the Ten Commandments. <laughs> I've heard too many preachers uh, either pass off the Ten Commandments. I've heard many amazing men and women of God 
sort of say the only reason for the Ten Commandments or the only reason for the Sermon on the Mount is simply to show us how sinful we are. I don't believe that. If you've gone here for a long time, I don't think that's why God gave us these commands. I think God gave us these commands because he loves us. The Ten Commandments are an amazing thing. When you think about the Bible in and of itself, Christianity and Judaism are different than other religions because our divine text came through people. We believe that the Spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim, came into prophets and came into different people, and through inspiration, they wrote the infallible, perfect Word of God. But most other texts from other religions, it's kind of like the heavens open and a literal book came down. So that's in a way what makes our sacred text a little different. So for us, we, as Christians and Jews, we have to weigh language and culture and things like this, except for a couple of things. One is all the sermons of Jesus Christ, and the other is the Ten Commandments. There might be other parts like, that I'm not thinking of, and I'm sure I'll get tweeted about this, but as far as I know, the Ten Commandments are the only part of the Old Testament where God literally wrote it by hand on tablets, handed it to Moses, and said, do this. <laughs> That's pretty sweet. And all of the word of God is important, but I believe that there's a reason the Ten Commandments has been the most widely accepted moral code in human history. That for over 3,000 years, this has been a pillar of civilization. Uh, I believe it's, it's a good thing. And, I be, and this is what I think. I believe at the heart of the Ten Commandments is dignity. The right of every single person to live every day with choice, with liberty, to own property, to make their own decisions, to not be violated, and to be free to live their own life without molestation of other people. I believe at the heart of the Ten Commandments is actually freedom, believe it or not. That the heart of the Ten Commandments is to create a culture of dignity and liberty. And I believe Think about it. If everyone actually followed the Ten Commandments, and nobody will follow them perfectly, but if everybody followed them perfectly, I think Dennis Prager made this point when we had our interview, nobody would have to lock their cars. Women would feel safe walking home at night. There would li literally be nothing you'd have to worry about. So the thing we want to be careful about is following the Ten Commandments won't get you into heaven. Trusting in Jesus Christ will. But following the Ten Commandments will bring heaven to earth. And that's why I think it's important. The more we believe in the Ten Commandments and live them out as a society, the more free, full, and life-giving our society will become. Ten Commandments must be at the heart of our culture. I believe the Ten Commandments very simply are this. It's ten ways to basically be a decent person. They're not gonna, it's not going to make you perfect. But can we start there? Just how do we treat one another decently? And that's why I think it's so foundational and so important. And we're going to spend some time knowing these Ten Commandments. So, I remember when I was living in Oklahoma, I believe it was the Oklahoma State Senate building, there was a big, you know, there was a big thing because one of these politicians uh, was, and I think rightly, frustrated that they wanted to remove the Ten Commandments from the state building. Um, some group, I forget who it was, was arguing that it was a violation of the, the boundary between church and state. And I thought, I think that's silly because I think that the Bible and the Ten Commandments are more than just religion, they're a part of our culture, but that's my own opinion. Anyway, so, but it was very funny because there was this politician who was saying the Ten Commandments are important, they're the foundation, I live my life by the Ten Commandments, I couldn't go on a day without the Ten Commandments, and this reporter, she goes, okay, thank you, Senator, um, what are the Ten Commandments? <laughs> and it was so funny because there was about two seconds, and I'm sure millions or whoever was watching, Every, all of us laughed at the same time. You could see the embarrassment on the look of this guy's face. He seemed to struggle to find even one. And you, you, don't want to, you don't want to lead off with thou shalt not murder, the most obvious one. You know, see? So anyway, and I actually pulled this trick one time, too. I was, I, I, you've heard the story before. I was doing a show in L.A. with a, the Learning Channel, and it was with a lot of great people. Most of them were not religious. And, and they all kind of said, oh, well, we're not religious, but we follow the Ten Commandments. Which I think is silly because the first four commandments are very religious, but aside from that, we're sitting around and we're not religious, we just live our life by the Ten Commandments. And so I said, what are the Ten Commandments? And so this table of very hip, very wealthy L.A. people 
started laughing and made a game out of it. Let's see if we can come up with the Ten Commandments. And they came up with two right ones and three wrong ones. <laughs> and they're like, how do we do, Pastor Bobby? Well, you got two. That's a, that's a 20%. That's an F. You failed. <laughs> you actually got negative 10 if I count the other three. So, I want the Ten Commandments to be written on your heart. If you're in a small group, the small groups are going to be memorizing the Ten Commandments in order. And I, I, I believe that many Christians say I believe in the Ten Commandments, but would, would struggle to tell you probably more than six of them. So you're probably trying to sort it out in your own mind. Fuck, how many can I think of? Thou shalt not commit immorality is not one of them. That's a silly one. <laughs> so I believe that I want to see the Ten Commandments written on your heart. So let's start. Let's begin. What is the first commandment? <laughs> okay, so you may have heard a mumbling because there are two opposing views about what the first commandment is. Almost every Christian tradition has the first commandment as, you shall have no other gods before me. But in Judaism, and I think they count because they wrote the Ten, well, God wrote it, the Ten Commandments, and they gave it to us, in the Talmud, and in only our denomination, I believe, the Reformed Church in America, we believe in a different first commandment. Like, wait, how can it be different? Because God didn't put numbers on it. He just, he's like, here they go. There was no numbers on those tablets. Those numbers were added later in a document called the Talmud. And so later on in the 13th century, Catholics changed the numbers around and most Christians adapted those new numbers. So they're almost the same except for one commandment and that's the first one. So we're going to teach the Jewish way, all right? Is that okay? You don't get to change a Jewish text, all right? You just don't get to do that uh, if you're not a Jew, all right? So, uh, and I think it's important. I think that Christians have missed out by not endorsing this as the first commandment. And this is the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now you can, now you can see why a lot of Christians changed it, right? Why did they change it? That ain't no command. That's a statement. How is that a command? I believe it is a command. Um, I believe it is a command that basically says this. Believe in the God who believes in you. Believe in the God who believes in you. I am a God that is on your side. I am a God that believes in you. I am a God that is for you. You are my people. I am your God. You will not be in slavery, but you will go to the promised land. I am on your side. Know me. Trust me. Know me. Trust me. Know me. Trust me. If we don't get this one right, the other nine won't work because what we'll be trying to do is simply doing morals we don't want to do that doesn't feel good. If you start with this is the first commandment, you believe that the things that you're learning are for the purpose of giving me the fullest, richest life possible. That's good. At the heart of I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery is this. I'm on your side. Know me and trust me. Maybe today you're watching and you just think, or you're here in the church, you just think, God hasn't been on my side, or God's not on my side. He is. And that doesn't mean life isn't hard. It doesn't mean you won't go through challenges. It doesn't mean you won't be stretched. It doesn't mean you won't get sick. It doesn't mean you won't face battles. But it does mean this. God will carry you through. He will carry you out of slavery, and he will bring you to your promised land. Have faith, and don't give up on him. In the, in the uh, Torah, so many of these people who were brought out of slavery and are wandering through the desert towards the promised land for years and years and years, moaned and complained to Moses, bring us back to Egypt. We want to go back to slavery. And that is the temptation of living in the in-between. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you're in that wilderness and you're waiting to get to your promised land and sometimes you think, I'm just going back to slavery. I'm just going to go back. I just want to go back. And God is saying, no. Not only are you not, only you're not going back, you don't have a choice. I'm not letting you go back to slavery. I am going to carry you, kicking and screaming to the promised land. And that's very good news, isn't it? I believe that with all my heart. Because in spite of all my flaws and all of my sin, God has blessed us and carried through every storm, and he will carry you too. God is on your side. So today, believe in the God who believes in you. So the first thing is this. The first aspect of this commandment is a command to know and to trust 
that God is on your side, and he is. And I think, and this is my own personal commentary, but Bobby Schuler thinks the second command is really that everyone deserves dignity and that everyone deserves liberty. I think this is a command about the awfulness of slavery. Slavery has been so common in history. In, in our modern era, much of it has been wiped out. But actually, there are more slaves today than there have ever been in history. And there is nothing more degrading and dehumanizing. In other words, there's nothing more opposite of liberty and opposite of dignity than slavery. God hates slavery because God loves people and because God gave us choice. God gave you will, choice, decisions. God gave you the power to lead your own life. And people want to take that away. They do. People want to take that away to use you, uh, to make you, and, and God does, God's not going to allow that to happen. There's a sort of deeper meaning here too. Many of us have found ourselves enslaved by this and that, enslaved by poverty, enslaved by lack, enslaved by sin, addiction, enslaved by the need to prove yourself, enslaved by depression or anxiety. Look, God doesn't want you enslaved. In Jesus' name, he's going to break every chain in your life. He's going to break every chain in your life. He is a good God. You can trust him. He loves you. He's on your side. He's going to carry you through to the promised land. That's a, that's a promise. And it's a command. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You ain't going back. You are not going back to Egypt. You are not going back to slavery. You will enter the promised land. And it's going to mean you're going to have to cross some rivers and cross some deserts and slay some giants. But we're going to get there together. We're going to do this. That's what the first commandment's about. And it's very hopeful. Don't you agree? <laughs> so, I believe at the heart of the Ten Commandments and at the Word of God in general, and at living a life of character, integrity, a moral life, I believe that living for God is the best place to be. I just believe that being in obedience to God's Word is the best, fullest, most fun, enriched place you can live your life. I know God. God created fun. God is the most joyful person in the universe. He's also the smartest person in the universe. And he is on your side. And he has given us this gift. How to live the richest, most exciting, amazing life possible for our whole life. Instead of just for a mere moment. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Society seems to want to give you a choice. Sometimes we also make this choice on our own accord, but society seems to want to give you this choice. You have a choice between a good life that is a moral life and a full life. You have a, cho a choice between a moral life and a full life. Which do you choose? And that is a lie. I have lived in sin long enough to know that a sinful life is not a full life. To know that a life without boundaries, without morals, without integrity, a life of hiddenness, a life of fakeness, a life of mask wearing, a life of shame is not a full life to live. If I've learned anything, it's that living a vulnerable life, warts and all, in the grace of Jesus Christ, striving for righteousness, growing in, in my Christ-likeness is the best place to live. To live every moment with the faith and confidence that comes with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Society says, what do you want, goodness or fullness? God says you can have goodness and fullness. In fact, the only way to be good is to be filled up, and the only way to be filled up is to be good. That's the kingdom of God. You don't listen to that. You don't listen to that voice. You know that, you know that God wants you to have a rich, full life, so don't forget it. Remember, when, it's, when the time comes that you have to make some of those difficult choices, remember, choose what is good, choose what is right. Because integrity is your strength, but it's also going to be your joy. It will be the thing that you'll look back and say, thank you, God, that I did the right thing. I think so much of life is sort of like having a battery pack. It's like so much of life is about energy. How many times do we not really thrive in life because we're just simply out of energy? Especially if you've got little kids. Especially if you've got little kids. Hannah, Juliana, if you've got little kids. You, you, it, that battery is empty. But there are other things, you know, like in general, I think we can train ourselves to have more energy. 
And I'm surprised to see how many people that have very little responsibility are constantly exhausted. I think that there's, there's something going on, and I think science even proves this, under the surface, that your soul is a bit like an iPhone battery. And you know how like on a computer or, a ba or, or any kind of phone, if you've got a bunch of programs running, all of a sudden that battery just starts going empty. You're like, why is my battery going empty so fast? I don't understand. And I think many of us have a lot of stuff going on under the surface that every day is draining just a little bit of that, that battery. That we're finishing each day wondering why am I completely out of energy? And there are, there are a lot of reasons for this, but I think one of them is that we live our life without boundaries and without rules. We don't say no to things. We, we get caught up in stuff we shouldn't get caught up in. And I think another reason is we don't feel safe to be vulnerable and honest and to, to drill down deep. So, I have seen people who live their life without rules and without boundaries, and they are exhausted and they are sick. If you have ever been a young person, you know, probably know what that's like. You probably know what it's like to live a life that with, completely without boundaries or rules. I believe that rules, as long as you don't become a legalist, having a rule for life or a way of life actually gives you freedom. That's for sure true in any nation state. If, you know, I, I'm constantly surprised that as a nation or many nations, they will create all of these laws without working on the moral heart of the people who are supposed to obey the law. If you see anything, it doesn't matter what your political laws are. If you don't have a moral compass of the people behind those laws, nobody's going to follow them. Having rules, in other words, having a moral compass or having a, a sense of what is right and wrong actually gives you freedom. It really does. And actually, living a life without rules is not really a fun life. It's like a game without rules. Have you ever tried to play a game without rules? It's not fun. I play games with my kids all the time, and I hate it because there's no rules. It's so boring. <laughs> You win, I win, we all win. It's all about having fun. It's not about having fun, it's about winning. <laughs> winning is fun. Losing is not fun. Losing teaches me I wanna have fun by winning. No, I, I, and, and just imagine, you know, you and a bunch of friends go out into a soccer field with a ball and you decide everybody's just gonna make up their own rules. Is that fun? You having a good time? Wacky scores, wacky boundaries, who knows? And life is like that. You know, a life with rules, a life with boundaries, a life with integrity, a life of a moral compass is actually a fun life. It's actually a life that gives you structure, a life that gives you freedom. And so allow me to be the lone voice in the wilderness in an age of, of uh, moral flexibility to just simply say that rules are good. And that legalism is bad, um, but so is a total lack of moral accountability. We gotta find something in the middle. And that's why you are so valuable to the world, that, sh that you are the type of person that finds yourself not like the Pharisee, where I'm completely bogged down with legalism, but not like the Sadducee, who says there's no moral code and nothing matters. You're like Christ, right in the middle. You know that it's about the spirit of the law and that the purpose of the law and the purpose of God's word is to create freedom and to create liberty and to give life and to create a full life that is you. I want to convince you that studying the Word of God and being a person of integrity is the fullest, richest life you can live. You just have to understand it right. And can I just throw in one little bonus? I believe there is actually a reward for those who seek righteousness. I believe there is a material, today kind of reward. I, I asked the question, literally, I've thought it before, but I'm like, is this in the Word of God? A few weeks ago, I began to study to just see if there is, in the Bible, a correlation between righteousness and blessing. And there are so many passages on it. I could literally do, just go all day reading the passages. You mean to read a couple of them? How about Deuteronomy 28, the most famous? He says, all of these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in. You will be blessed when you go out. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty to send rain on your land 
in the season and bless all of the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands that the Lord your God is giving you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top and never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods or serving them. Is that pretty clear? Whoa. Now, I don't want to make a formula out of this. I know there's lots of time when the righteous suffer and struggle, but man, it seems to be pretty clear that the prayer of a righteous man avails much. That he who walks in righteousness will be wealthy and wise. I mean, the, the passages just continue to go on and on that there is some actual blessing for those who seek after righteousness. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks, he says, you guys always worry, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? What are we going to do? You worry about all these things that pagans worry about. And then he says, but seek first the kingdom and his what? His righteousness. And then what will happen? And all those things will be added to you. You think he's talking about heavenly blessing there? Maybe, but he specifically is talking about clothes, money, health. I mean, he's talking about real things today. So I just want to throw this out there. I, I, I know, everybody's like, uh-oh, you know, laser, you know, sword eyes. <laughs> Are you saying that there's an actual material benefit blessing for those who seek after righteousness? Let me just clear the air. Yes, I am. Because the word of God says it and I don't see any way around it. And though I can't ex always explain some of the ins and outs of it, I believe. And I don't think it means God re rewards perfect people. I think it means it, he regards those, as Jesus said, who seek after his kingdom and his righteousness. If your heart is geared, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to have flaws, and the, the grace of Jesus Christ is there for you. But if you, if you seek after him, I believe you will be blessed. And not just materially blessed. I think you'll have the fullness of life that is made available in the kingdom of God. I think today I just can't finish today without giving you the opportunity to make a decision. That's really the problem. Many of us, we hear things like this. We think things like this. But we leave and then we go and get nachos. And we <laughs> go and watch football. And you just kind of forget. And I, I, I just feel like I need to put it to you. When Joshua was entering the promised land, he said to the people, many of you have been worshiping idols and you've also been worshiping God. You've been doing both. But the Lord says to you, you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. You can't live for one and the other. You must make a decision. And then Joshua famously says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And today I'm calling you. I'm going to actually offer you the chance to come down right now and become a happy and whole student of Jesus. Um, we don't do this much here, but I'm actually going to challenge you to stand up in front of everybody and walk down here. Maybe, you, maybe you've fallen behind and you need to get your life right, or maybe today you need to make a decision for God. I just want to say this to you. Nothing would bring more joy to my heart, to the heart of God, and to the people that are sitting with you than for you to come down and to receive Christ. And so today, I'm asking you to make a decision. Many of you have already made this decision. That's fine. But for some of you, you've been teetering. You've been riding the fence. And you need to make a choice. Normally, pastors say, I want every head back down, every eye closed. I want every head up, chin up, everybody looking around. Looking around. Look behind you. Look at your neighbor. I think that becoming a Christian begins with an act of courage. It means that not sneaking silently and quietly while well, nobody really can hold me. I want everybody, I want a thousand people to see you stand and say, I'm making a decision. And if not, I don't care. I want you, I want you to do something brave. And so in this moment, I'm going to ask even now, if you want to re receive Christ, just stand up where you are and just walk down right here, right now. And I'm going to ask the organ place to make the silence not so awkward. <laughs> Thank you, Jelko. The first one's always the bravest. It always, uh, you know, the first one's always the bravest, but um, I think that counts. Thank you. If you want to receive Christ, <laughs> and just come down here, friends, just come right here. Right here. Thanks.
Look, if you're, not, if you're not sure, just come down anyway. Like, it's not gonna hurt you. Like, what, are you worried about your reputation? Maybe you're thinking like, oh, well, my family and friends are here, I'll do it later. What if there is no later? Life is short and life is unpredictable. And there will be a time in your life where you may remember this as the most important decision you ever made. And you say, well, I'll stand up for God on my own. If you can't stand up for God in church, how are you gonna stand up for God in the world? How are you gonna do that? So Lord is here. Don't feel shame, feel joy, feel life. Come and receive the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and receive eternal life. If you're not sure, just come, it's okay. All right. Maybe you're gonna leave here and uh, you're going to say, I wish I would have done it. Just call the church or come back to the second service. You know, maybe I'll do it again then. Um, thank you, friends, for coming down and for uh, making a public decision that I want to, wherever you are, I want to make a decision to follow Christ and to walk as a Christian. So I'm going to ask you to pray this with me. And friends, would you pray with me? And if you're watching on TV, join us in this prayer. This is available to everyone. Maybe hold your hands out like this, church, towards these people. And everybody who's here, do this as a sign of receiving like this. You're just receiving goodness. You're going to receive a blessing and joy and life and forgiveness. So say this after me. Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of my sins. Teach me your ways. And write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I trust you and love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And Lord, I pray a special blessing over these people. If there's those who've made a decision in their chairs or at home, I pray in Jesus' name that everything would change in their life for the better. That whatever they're going through, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. That, that sin, that addiction, that, all, that worry, that fear, that anxiety, that sickness, Lord, these things would be removed from them. That is a part of the curse. And Lord, the cross has taken all those things from us and given us life. And so I pray that you receive that life and receive the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here today. I believe your week is going to go better. You're going to have more joy and fullness and blessing in everything you do. I, I want to speak that over you. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are so glad that you could join us for today's Hour of Power. These services are on at this time every week, so be sure not to miss us next time. Don't forget to find us on Facebook. Just type in Hour of Power New Zealand and you can connect with us whenever you like. If you want to stay up to date with what is happening with Hour of Power New Zealand, please like us on Facebook. Just look for Hour of Power New Zealand. You can also call us on 0800 14 HOPE. That's 0800 144 673. Write to us at PO Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland 1344. Or jump on our website, hourofpower.org.nz.
www.faithfm.co.nz. Faith is what we all need when we're facing life's greatest challenges. A life-threatening diagnosis, unemployment, or the loss of a loved one. Week by week, we hear how the Hour of Power is helping people to build a sustaining Christ-focused faith. The reason that Hour of Power has been on air in New Zealand for so many years is because viewers and listeners of Hour of Power give their support. Yes, we're talking about you, and we'd like to say thank you. Right now, Hour of Power in New Zealand is facing its toughest times in many years since the ministry began. Today, we're asking for your help so we can continue to broadcast Hour of Power on air for you and for thousands of viewers like you. Please pray that Hour of Power continues to build faith and heal hearts across New Zealand. We would love you to connect with us. We want to know how you're benefiting from and enjoying the music and message on Hour of Power. Please contact us on 0800 14 HOPE. That's 0800 144 673. Or write to us, PO Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland 1344. Or hourofpower.org.nz. Find us on Facebook, Hour of Power New Zealand. Contact us today. Bobby is passionate about helping you to become a happy disciple of Jesus. If you would like Bobby's latest Bible study based on this current series of messages, contact us and we'll get that out to you as soon as possible. And now from all of us here at the Hour of Power, I'm Laurel McCullough. God loves you and so do we.